Okay, it's 12 o'clock, so we'll get started. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining me uh, for today's webinar where we're going to be talking about performance management. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Erin. I, I head up the Employment and Workplace Relations team here at Vincent Young. Uh, we do these webinars each month. Um, and this webinar is actually as a result of a poll that we did or that I did on LinkedIn. Um, and I put a, a few topics up um, and everyone could vote on which topic they wanted to hear about. So um, for today, we're talking about performance management. Um, I'm not precious about people asking questions as we go through. So if you do have any questions, just pop them in the chat. Um, and I'll do my best to answer them as we go through. And um, there's usually some time at the end for me to go through those questions as well. So I'll make sure I get through as many as I can um, during the session. And obviously feel free to email me if you have any follow-up questions after the webinar. Uh, also, people ask around the slides and the recording. So I do send out the slides. Uh, and if you do uh, would like a copy of the recording, just feel free to email me and I can send you through a copy of the recording. Uh, I think that's all the housekeeping, so we'll get started. Um, in terms of what we're going to talk about today, I'm going to draw a distinction between performance management and performance reviews. I think um, we've got a mixture of people on here today in terms of HR managers um, and also managers in terms of team leaders or people that manage a team. So I'll try to cover off both aspects as we go through all of these um, Topics, we'll talk about performance management and bullying. Uh, what I find in practice is that um, a lot of complaints of bullying um, tend to arise once a performance management process, process has started. Um, and we'll actually look at a case um, where that was the case um, and the employee made an unfair dismissal claim. Um, and the um, concepts around what bullying is, we'll have a look at that and um, how the legislation deals with that. Uh, we'll also have a look at performance management in a remote context and if anything's changed now that um, probably a lot more people are working from home. For those of you who just watched the announcement, um, Greater Sydney's in lockdown for another four weeks, so um, it's very relevant right now, I think. Uh, we'll also touch on the responsibility of managers. Um, so obviously people who lead a team or manage a team, um, how they deal with performance management, some tips around um, how to have conversations, all those types of things. Um, we'll look at termination of employment, if that's something that is the result of performance management. Um, and we'll also have a look at some other options that are not necessarily termination of, of employment. We'll focus on unfair dismissal and there's a reason we do that. Um, and then I'll just um, end with some practical tips. And like I said, um, if you do have any questions as we go through, feel free to ask them or I'll answer them at the end. Um, so just to set the scene, I wanted to um, draw this distinction between performance management and performance reviews, uh, because I think um, people have a different view of what both of those concepts mean. And I think we're probably need to break the myth a bit around that as well. So from my perspective, um, performance reviews are those things that happen usually in an organisation um, at a six, six month mark or a um, 12 month mark, something like that. Or you might do it quarterly. Um, and what it's an opportunity to do, it's a more formal setting um, for managers to give feedback um, for employees to receive feedback and also um, the other way. So if, if you do, for example, 360 um, performance reviews, things like that, it might also be the opportunity for the employee to give feedback in terms of um, the leaders, um, how the leader is going or um, constructive feedback in terms of that. Um, so from my perspective, performance reviews really form part of that whole performance management process. Because again, from my perspective, when you usually hear people talk about performance management, um, it's when uh, the performance isn't meeting the standards that are required and you're needing to take steps to redress that performance. From my perspective, it shouldn't just be that. It shouldn't only come up when you are, for example, not happy with someone's performance or someone's performance is slipping or not meeting the KPIs, things like that. It should really start from the recruitment process. 
Um, and I think if you do that, then um, the words performance management, uh, I think for em most employees don't carry that, oh gosh, I'm gonna be terminated connotation. If you really um, talk about performance management um, and performance in general from the beginning, so from recruitment. Um, and so what I think um, is really important is that when you do recruit new employees, um, that you talk to them about um, how performance will be managed by the business. And if you are a manager or a leader, how you will address performance um, throughout the employee's employment. And I think that that should happen on a far more regular basis than just your performance reviews. Um, so you should be giving that informal feedback along the way. Don't let something pile up until um, you get to that six month mark and then give a performance review and give the person two out of five or something like that, if you have that type of scoring mechanism. Um, so I think from my perspective, if we have that conversation up front and we're really upfront with employees around how we manage performance and to expect feedback that can be good feedback and also constructive feedback throughout that employment life cycle. So that that term performance management in general isn't so, I think it doesn't have that negative connotation so much. In terms of performance reviews, again, organisations tend to use it sometimes as like a benchmarking um, exercise as well in terms of across the business, if you have employees at similar levels, it might then influence um, performance-based remuneration. So it might influence how someone's um, salary increases for a particular year or if they get a bonus for that particular year. So I, I, I know there's validity in doing those performance reviews and having that formal process, um, but I think the concept of managing performance should happen throughout the whole life cycle and not just at that six month mark or the three month mark, whenever you do it formally. Um, also, it can be a risk mitigation strategy in terms of it's a chance hopefully for you to formally document um, that performance as well. Um, and as we go through today's session, you'll see that I really talk about the importance of documentation, especially if you do get to that um, point where you are looking at, for example, termination of employment, your documentation becomes very important then. Um, but sometimes you can use it. So uh, for example, if someone does bring an unfair dismissal claim, um, one of the things that will probably come up is, well, what was their performance like? How did they score in performance reviews? Um, and that's a thing I find as well um, that can sometimes be difficult. Um, if you do use that uh, system where you, for example, give them a mark out of five or a mark out of 10, or it's below expectations, meets expectations, exceeds expectations, things like that. I think um, as managers and as HR, you need to think carefully about how you actually use that system and that as managers, you are legitimately um, considering people's performance and where they should be marked on that scale if you're using that type of scale. And a lot of organisations have done away with that scaling-based um, process because of some of the issues that sometimes arise. And one of those issues is that if you've got an employee that's kind of um, mediocre, you'll probably score them in the middle. So like a three out of five, something like that. Um, and then down the track, if they haven't improved and we're looking at termination of employment, um, we'll say, well, you scored them three out of five. That's not so bad. That's above medium. Um, so again, just think about how you're using that performance review process. And if you are benchmarking, make sure you're doing it and thinking about it. Um, practically as well in terms of forward thinking. So how that could be used by an employee, for example, in, in an unfair dismissal claim. Um, so don't just always give employees three out of five, things like that. Um, and especially if it's an employee whose performance isn't really meeting the expectations, you need to give a valid performance review. Um, so I just really wanted to set that scene in terms of the concept of performance reviews, which is usually, like I said, that more formal process versus performance management. Um, and I think, like I said, that should start from employment. When you talk about your values, when you talk about how you're going to manage people or the expectations around working at the organisation, um, I think you should really be making performance and the management of performance at the forefront so that when this type of thing comes up, people, as I said, aren't so negative about it. Um, in terms of performance management in itself, I think there's some, some things you need to think about in terms of um, that process in general. 
Um, so if you are um, going to manage performance, and again, from an organisational perspective, um, think about do you have a policy around performance management or performance reviews? So in contracts, there'll usually be um, sometimes a mention of performance reviews. Again, be careful of what wording you use in your contracts. Um, if it says we will conduct a performance review, that's generally placing an obligation on you to conduct a performance review if it says annually. Um, so just think about that. You might like to change that to May, again, to just give you some discretion. And also um, another key thing is to make sure that it's clear to employees from a performance review perspective um, that just because you have a performance review doesn't mean you're going to necessarily get a pay rise. Um, so that wording should be included in there as well. Um, separate from that, you might have a policy around performance management. I generally say um, try not to have policies or if you do make them um, very flexible in terms of how you can manage performance. Um, because what I've seen from a practical perspective is uh, employers come unstuck if they have a very rigorous process in terms of how they say they're going to manage performance and they don't follow that process. Then an employee might say, for example, in an unfair dismissal claim, they have this process, but they didn't follow it. Um, and that could impact a decision in terms of an unfair dismissal um, claim. So think about, do you have a policy? Um, think about, do you need a policy? As I said, if you do have one, make it as flexible as possible. So have wording that says, this is a general outline of the process, but we have discretion to change and amend that policy um, or change the process that we might use depending on the circumstances. Um, now, when we're coming to looking at someone's performance, um, if there are issues, so this is in a situation where we're saying someone isn't performing to the standard that's required, we need to really drill down into what are the issues. So be as specific as possible um, when you're addressing what the performance that um, isn't up to standard is. Um, and so, again, if you're in HR or if you're a manager who manages other managers, you want to really be testing those people who are coming to you saying, oh, we need to do something about Erin's performance. Um, you really want to be testing those people and saying, well, what are the issues? So that we can be quite specific in terms of what we need that employee to do to improve their performance. And that comes into also gathering as much information as you can around what those performance concerns are. Um, the position description is also quite important. Um, so if you have a position description um, or if you use position descriptions, um, make sure that they are valid to the um, role that's being performed as well. Um, so that, again, you can refer back to those if needed to say, well, this is what's required of your role and these are the, the things that you aren't meeting. Um, so that can be a very good document to have a, a reference back to for an employee when we're saying, well, when you signed up to your employment contract, these are, this is what we said um, the role was um, and these are the things you're not meeting. And we'll have a look at a case that involved KPIs that were in a contract as well. Um, your documentation is very important. Um, so in terms of having these types of conversations, and documenting if your policy says you give warnings or you decide to do a performance improvement plan, something like that, make sure that you're documenting all of those steps along the way. Um, and even if you start to have informal conversations with an employee around performance, document those as well. So write a file note, send an email, something like that. Um, because again, from a um, management perspective, giving feedback to employees, I think most of us can agree it's not really that comfortable giving that feedback to you. Um, it's kind of an uncomfortable conversation, probably one you don't really want to be having. Um, so as much as possible, document the conversation, have the conversations um, up front when the issues arise. Don't let them kind of go for six months and only address it at that performance review phase. Um, because, again, what I find in practice is um, what we call the managers performance managing in their head. So they think they've articulated to employees that there's issues around performance, but the employees have no idea. Um, and then that's when you get that negative connotation with performance management and why you sometimes find employees don't really want to participate in performance reviews because 
they know it's going to be a build up of everything that they've done wrong in the last six months. Um, so again, I think um, just be mindful of that concept of performance managing in your head and making sure that you are actually communicating to the employee the things where they need to pick up their performance or if there's been customer feedback that's um, saying they need to be more responsive to calls or something like that, address that as soon as you can. Don't just leave it. Um, and also make sure your performance management process is reasonable. Um, and that's very important in um, what we'll talk about from a remote context um, and also just in general, because when it comes to, for example, an employee bringing a claim around um, performance management and saying that their dismissal was unfair, the court will look at how you engaged in the process and whether it was reasonable. Um, so that means you need to kind of assess it on a case by case basis. It can't just be a one size fits all approach. Um, and again, we'll look at it couple of cases in particular that really shows how um, you need to kind of um, navigate a particular circumstances to make sure that you avoid a claim of unfair dismissal, for example. Um, as I said, uh, what I find in practice, and I think it comes along with that negative connotation that relates to performance management, is that um, a lot of um, complaints or you use the uh, you hear the word bullying being used quite a lot um, when an employee starts to be performance managed. Again, as I said, it's not really a comfortable conversation, probably a conversation you don't want to be having, and particularly from the employee's perspective, probably not feedback they really want to be hearing. Again, I think if you start those um, conversations from the recruitment phase, that kind of negative connotation will be less, but I still think it's um, going to be an uncomfortable conversation. Um, so the thing to remember, and again, what I find in practice is sometimes why um, managers performance manage in their head or don't like having those conversations is because they fear that the employee is going to bring a claim of bullying or make allegations of bullying. And so we really need to look at, well, is that a justifiable concern? Um, as I said, in practice, it does happen a lot. Whether that employee is actually going to be successful in a bullying claim is a whole nother story. Uh, because when we look at the definition of what bullying is in what's called the Fair Work Act, which is a piece of legislation that covers most organisations in Australia, um, for bullying to have occurred, there needs to be basically repeated unreasonable behaviour towards a worker or a group of workers, and that creates a risk to health and safety. Um, and also what the legislation has done is create an exception to that or really say that reasonable management action does not amount to bullying and for the most part you engaging in reasonable management action in terms of performance management is not going to amount to bullying so if you're carrying out the process and that's why I looked at that concept of reasonableness um, if you're carrying out performance management and you're doing it in a reasonable manner manner so for example you're not holding a whole team meeting and calling out one individual and saying your performance is really not up to scratch and if you don't um, improve that performance your employment might be terminated if you're having those one-on-one -on -one conversations and providing constructive feedback and giving the employee a kind of um, timeline of what we're looking for in terms of that improvement in performance and what we need to see for that um, performance to improve uh, then that's going to be reasonable management action and an employee is not going to be successful in a bullying claim um, so in terms of what the court or the commission will take into account, um, as I said, those ongoing meetings to address underperformance won't um, amount to bullying for the most part, unless you're doing something unreasonable. Um, you should schedule those meetings um, so that you can have that conversation. And as I said, if you set up front what you're going to do with employees at the recruitment phase, so we're going to have weekly meetings and we're going to talk about your performance, those types of things. Um, then it's not going to come as a shock to the employee. Um, you need to, as I said, um, carry it out in a reasonable manner so you can't be irrational or absurd. So we can't be setting unreasonable expectations around an employee's performance that they're never going to achieve, things like that. So there's been cases, for example, where managers have set employees up to fail um, by setting unrealistic targets and things like that. So if there's that type of action going on, then that's not going to meet the definition of reasonable management action. But if you're conducting that performance management process and you've thought about if a policy applies and you can refer to the position description, those types of things, 
Um, if an employee does um, make a complaint of bullying, then it can be dealt with relatively easily because it's going to meet that definition of reasonable management action. Um, in practice, um, again, as I said, a lot of managers, I think, are concerned about a claim of bullying um, if they start to performance manage or how they deal with a claim of bullying if that's raised. Um, if a claim of bullying is raised by an employee um, if when you're having a conversation with them about their performance, um, you need to really deal with those two issues separately. So if an employee makes a complaint of bullying whilst you're having a one-on-one -on -one performance management conversation with them, um, I would just generally conclude the meeting and then obviously raise it um, with your uh, HR um, team if you've got one or um, a senior leader and say, this is what's happened. Here's my documentation of the meetings. Here's my previous documentation of all the meetings we've had. Um, and then what will generally happen is the um, organisation should deal with that employee's complaint discreetly. Um, and then the performance management can continue. Um, in terms of whether they continue at the same time, generally, no, you would stop the performance management process um, whilst that complaint um, is being dealt with. Or if there's another manager that could, for example, continue that performance management, um, then that can happen as well. So I'm not saying you have to halt it altogether. You just need to make an assessment um, in terms of whether it can continue while that complaint is also being investigated or not. Um, but I wanted to also give you some statistics in terms of, um, as I said, what I think is a concern um, in terms of performance management and seeing complaints of bullying. And what's on the screen there is from the, um, the last year's annual report from the Fair Work Commission in terms of the complaints that they have dealt with. And you can see the order to stop bullying here, which is the complaint that would be made to the commission, is quite low, so quite um, a fair way down that list compared to the other types of claims that we see. Um, as probably you can expect, unfair dismissal is the most common type of claim that the Commission deals with. Um, and so that's why um, we'll talk about unfair dismissal quite in depth because that's really where an organisation can come unstuck um, in terms of performance management rather than, for example, a bullying claim. Um, <clears throat> sorry, this is just a case where an employee made a complaint of bullying um, on termination. So uh, they had been subject to performance management and um, they resigned from their employment. And in their resignation letter, they made allegations of bullying against the manager who had been engaging in the performance management. And they made an unfair dismissal claim um, alleging what we call constructive dismissal, which we don't need to go into for the purposes of this um, session. But basically, um, this happens, again, quite a lot in practice. So I thought it was um, just interesting to touch on this case um, because, again, I just wanted to fill you with some confidence of how the Commission will look at those types of complaints. And, again, the importance of your documentation and having those meetings and being clear around that performance management process. Um, so you can see there that the Commission um, said... It would be unfortunate if the custom and practice arose of employees making allegations of bullying because of ordinary disciplinary or similar action. In this case, on the material before me, I do not accept that the applicant was bullied or that the employer acted inappropriately. Um, so the commission is very well aware that um, an employee might make a complaint of bullying if they're not happy with the performance management process that's being engaged in. Um, so they will call out um, that type of behaviour if it's necessary in a complaint um, and say that, well, no, we think all the actions taken by the employer were reasonable in those circumstances. Um, and again, you can see uh, in terms of how they dealt with the complaint, uh, sorry, the performance management, it says the employer raised a range of matters with the employee. They were given an opportunity to respond and they did respond and the evidence correlates with handwritten me meeting notes and other material. Again, stressing the importance of you keeping documentation around that performance management um, process and any conversations you're having with employees around um, performance management. So I just wanted to go through that case just to show you that um, yes, probably um, there's a valid um, concern that an employee might make a bullying claim, but actually when you see in practice, they don't tend to make them that much. And if they do, the commission is very well aware that if you've got all the documentation um, together and you've engaged in reasonable management action, then they're going to deal with a bullying complaint 
relatively swiftly and say there's no bullying in those circumstances. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is performance management in a remote context. Um, which is very relevant for some of us right now. Um, there's obviously always been employees that work from home um, for a lot of organisations, but I think it's probably increased um, in the last 18 months. And um, the, the um, tile I have on the screen there says some things change, some things stay the same. Um, so I think this is relevant for the performance management um, concept in a remote context. For the most part, things should stay the same. So it doesn't mean that you can't performance management performance manage an employee just because they're working remotely. Um, you should follow the process that you've always followed. It just might be that you need to have the meetings via Zoom, things like that. Um, but also some things will need to change. Um, and we've seen that in terms of um, some cases that have come out of um, unfair dismissals generally that um, the commission has dealt with. And what I mean by that is you need to think about for example, if you're measuring an employee against KPIs, have those KPIs, are they still reasonable given that, for example, the employee is working from home? So has the, that working from home um, impacted on what we think they can achieve in terms of those KPIs? So if they're a retail employee and they have a um, target they need to meet and retail is shut down, obviously meeting that KPI um, is probably not going to be possible. And also the commission, I think, would say not reasonable in those circumstances if you terminated them because of that. Um, so as a, that's why I've got on the screen there, some things change, some things stay the same, because I think you need to um, just be mindful of there might be things in that normal performance management process that we might need to tweak a little bit because the employee is working from home or remotely. Um, in terms of um, the things that stay the same, um, so setting those clear goals and objectives, having that ongoing communication, giving that regular feedback. Um, and from that perspective, um, again, it's a probably, um, a bit more difficult. So if you're in an office environment and you've got your team there all the time, you can walk past their desk and have that ongoing communication and give regular feedback. When we're all working from separate locations, you need to make a conscious effort to be doing that um, because that's something that I think can fall by the wayside um, in terms of you're busy dealing with clients or whatever your um, job is. And perhaps as a manager or a leader, um, that effort to make the um, have the conversations or give the feedback um, really needs to I think be front of mind if we are working remotely because we don't want employees left to their own devices and we don't talk to them for four weeks because everyone's in a different location. Um, as I said uh, you need to think about being flexible um, so we'll look at a case um, in a minute that looked at performance management process for an employee that was working remotely um, and as I said, think about if you need to kind of tweak um, performance management um, KPIs or the um, standards that you're requiring of employees because of changes to how they're currently carrying out their work. Um, and the other thing, which is a whole separate session really, um, is considering employees' well-being. So um, again, a lot of organisations have been very good at um, recognising that employees' wellbeing and mental health can have a huge impact, particularly in a pandemic. Um, so those are factors that you also need to take into consideration um, when you're engaging in performance management. Uh, if an employee raises those types of things, then we kind of need to consider that in terms of how we go about that performance management process. Um, and again, um, the Commission will, in terms of an unfair dismissal, um, will consider things like that if they've been raised by an employee, they'll consider how an organisation dealt with that. Um, so again, again, what support you gave to an employee um, if they, for example, raised those um, issues in a performance management process. Um, so this now takes me to the case. Um, someone just said, I have to leave, will I send the recording out? Um, yes, if you email me, um, I'll send the recording to you if you need to leave early. Uh, so this uh, involved a case from last year uh, and it involved a sales, uh, so they were basically like a pet sales um, 
organization. So they sold a lot of pet products and this involved a sales employee. Um, and their employment was terminated uh, early last year um, in April, 2020. Um, and so to give you some background, um, what that organization had done um, is started a performance management process with this employee. So she had been employed since 2018 um, as a salesperson working remotely. Um, and they um, started a performance management process or started having conversations with her um, in July, January 2020. One of the interesting things in this case is that that um, performance management or having conversations with the employee um, started when there was a change in her manager, which again happens quite a lot in practice. Um, what we see is that a new manager comes in um, to an organisation and the old manager mightn't have done much feedback in terms of performance and those types of things. Um, and so we see a change in management, which then means employees might have um, more regular feedback, things like that. So again, that's why I think it's really important to set the scene early if you are a manager or to get your managers to set the scene earlier if you're HR or leaders um, around how they will manage performance because that does happen sometimes in organisations. A new manager comes in, they have a way of doing things that's very different to the old manager. Um, and then employees kind of get a, caught a bit off guard. So if you have those conversations up front, I think it can be dealt with quite easily there. Um, so this had been a change of management. Um, and what this employee's contract said, um, it did have specific KPIs that they needed to do, which included giving um, sales updates. Um, so they had to do that, I believe, weekly, um, which was part of the contract. Um, and so this employee had kind of been a bit slack in doing that. Um, and so in January of that year, they had a meeting with her and said, um, you need to um, give us those um, sales figures and that sales report. And that was on, I think, the 31st of January, they had that conversation with her. Um, and then she said, okay, understand. Um, and then she did pick up her performance in that regard. So I believe for the next five weeks, she submitted the reports as was required. Um, and then obviously in that time also, we had COVID start. And so what happened was um, that in March of that year, so a couple of months after that first conversation, uh, employees um, had their salary reduced and also their hours reduced. So they had 20% pay cut and also 20% reduced um, reduction in hours. Um, and then um, they issued, in this case, a formal warning letter to her around um, her failures. So after that March reduction, she then kind of fell off the bandwagon in terms of doing those reports. And what they actually started to ask was daily reports in, instead of weekly reports. Because everyone was had gone to this remote context, they wanted to manage everyone's workload and performance and said, we now need you to re report daily. And so this employee wasn't doing that. And so she was terminated um, for her failure to do those things. Um, and they also relied on some other aspects which are not relevant for this session around um, social media posts that she did and things like that. Um, the Fair Work Commission um, said that this dismissal was unfair. Um, they said there was no valid reason for the termination and also the process that was engaged in was not fair. Um, and they said that um, the employee's performance could not be objectively assessed against orthodox working hours or standard of performance um, or standard performance criteria when there had been those changes to her working hours, her pay and her job security. So that was very important for the commission. Um, so they said there had been this reduction in hours and pay and there was uncertainty and so terminating her because she wasn't doing those daily reports was probably unreasonable, unfair in those circumstances. And we'll have a look at why they said that. Um, and basically what they said is a lesser form of disciplinary action was probably warranted in those circumstances. So a form of warning or something like that. Um, so what the commission said is not all performance failures are going to be a valid reason for termination or dismissal. So to um, get up or to win an unfair dismissal claim, you need to show there's a valid reason for termination. Um, and so the commission said the seriousness of the failure in performance, you need to consider that in the context and the circumstances of the particular case. 
And so what they said um, in terms of this performance issue that was raised um, was factors weighing in favour of the seriousness of those performance issues were that it was contractual in nature. So as I mentioned, her contract did require her to undertake those activities and um, make those reports. Um, they said um, that it was reasonable to ask for those daily reports in light of the trust um, devolved to a remote, remote working salesperson. Um, in addition, her failure um, was a failure to submit at all not just a failure to submit on time. So instead of filing her daily reports late, so two days later or whatever, she was just not doing them at all. Um, there was a pattern of inconsistency over a couple of months. It wasn't just a single act of not submitting the report. And that she had knowledge from the end of January um, that they had to be done on time consistently. So they'd had that conversation with her, as I mentioned in January. So that was the factors that weighed in favour of saying, okay, yes, this was a serious performance issue. The factors that weighed against a finding that the performance was so serious that it amounted to a valid reason for termination was um, that the um, requirements had to be incorporated into a broader range of daily activities and responsibilities. So it wasn't just her whole role was to submit these daily um, sales reports. It was something that had been incorporated into her whole role. She had to undertake those requirements um, and they couldn't be undertaken at the expense of servicing customers because her contract said that face-to-face -face customer time is paramount every day and that basically you have to serve your customers first and everything else comes later. This is like down the rung in terms of importance. Um, so she was making a choice to focus on the customers and the clients in those circumstances and not so much on submitting those daily reports. Um, and that after she'd been spoken to in January, she had made a genuine effort to comply but hadn't done, but had done that inconsistently. Um, and then in March 2020, when there was those changes to her hours of work and her pay, that's when she really fell off the bandwagon. And that's those things that they considered really important, I think, in this case. So they said that significant factors that mitigate the seriousness were the workload. So her workload had been put now into four days um, and the hours and the pay reduction. So it's just something to think about in terms of performance management, particularly in a situation, I think, where an employee has historically worked, for example, at a site location or at an office location, and they're now working from home and there's been changes to their role or how they might perform their role. You need to really think about those things if you are going to engage in performance management, because those are the things that the commission or the court will consider in terms of a claim of unfair dismissal, for example. Um, we'll talk a bit more about that um, case when I come to unfair dismissal um, particularly, but I just wanted to talk about that performance management process and that remote context and say, you need to be mindful of perhaps as I said, tweaking what the performance requirements are if someone's um, role has changed because they are now working remotely. Uh, in terms of managers' responsibilities, as I said, I think you need to be having that discussion throughout the year. Don't just have it on your six monthly performance review as part of that whole performance management process. Um, I think also for organisations, it's really good to think about training how your managers to have these conversations. Um, because as I said, it's difficult, it's a difficult conversation, not one you probably want to be having. Um, and most managers are promoted because they're good at their job, not because they're good at people management, otherwise they'd probably be in HR. Um, so you need to think about that. And yes, they've got great skills in terms of doing their role, but do they have great skills in terms of managing people? And I think um, organisations can do a lot to help the managers have those conversations by giving them training around how to have the conversation. So thinking, putting yourself in that um, employee's shoes, being sensitive to um, things that might arise for them, um, not having to convince them that their performance is not up to standard. So making sure that in, uh, managers know that it's not a convincing exercise. We just need to be um, telling the employee, this is why we think your performance isn't up to scratch. Here's the data or here's what we're relying on. Um, it's not a convincing exercise. 
And then obviously if something like a, a bullying complaint does come up in that context, how they deal with that. So as I said, stopping the conversation, concluding that meeting, raising it, saying this is what the employee said, making sure we've got the documentation and managers are trained around or keeping all the documentation that's happened to date for that if a complaint of bullying is made. Um, that, that then we can deal with that and we've got the documentation and evidence there about what we've done to date. Um, but I think, yeah, making sure in, uh, managers are equipped to do this process and have these conversations because um, sometimes it can be a daunting task, particularly for managers who are just coming into the role, so who've been promoted and things like that. I think it's really important to do that training um, for them. Um, the other thing to think about, so when we think about performance management, generally, again, um, your uh, what I find in practice is managers are coming to HR, for example, and saying, oh, we need to performance manage this person. When a decision's already made, been made by the manager that they need to go, that employee needs to leave the organisation, it really shouldn't be at that point that you're having the conversation. It needs to be much earlier on um, so that we can manage performance. And really, performance management shouldn't just be a way to exit someone from an organisation. Performance management, if it's done properly, should hopefully turn around that person's performance and they pick up their performance. Like in that example that we just saw, um, she was spoken to in January about what she needed to do and her performance did improve for um, that period until there was that COVID um, reduction in hours and things like that. So again, don't necessarily just think about performance management as a way to exit someone from an organisation and don't just go to HR, for example, when we're at that point saying we can't bear it anymore, we need to get rid of this person. We need to engage much earlier on in terms of that process. Um, a performance improvement plan, I think, is important um, from a documentation perspective as well. In, and we'll look at um, that case we just looked at in terms of there was no performance improvement plan in that case. And that was an um, issue for the organisation in that circumstance. And then again, think about, as I said, you don't necessarily have to have this written a policy, but think about, do, can we give warnings to improve that performance? Um, before we need to go down to the termination um, path. The other thing is what I've got on the screen there called a negotiated um, separation. Um, so that's, for those of you who don't know, that's a situation where you might have a conversation with the employee. Um, and you sometimes do that when you think that it's probably too far gone. So we've tried to improve the performance and it's not really um, coming to fruition. We might say, look, um, and it's, done on a without prejudice basis, look, it's really clear to us and probably to you that this isn't gonna work. Let's come to an agreement on how we can exit. And that's really coming back to that, putting yourself in that person's shoes um, and thinking about ways we can exit a person potentially from the organization, but do it in a sensitive manner rather than terminating their employment um, by email or something. And then we find ourselves in an unfair dismissal claim, something like that. So again, think about options um, before you necessarily just come to a, um, a conclusion that the employment needs to be terminated. You need to probably go through a process before that. Um, in terms of the legal risks, there's a whole array of risks. Um, but as I um, showed in that um, slide where we had the types of complaints that were made, from a performance management con um, context, I think um, the most top common types of complaints you generally see are an unfair dismissal claim um, and sometimes a general protections claim. We'll focus on unfair dismissal here today because I think that's the most common. Um, but there's other ones as I've got on the screen there. Um, so for example, if a contract said um, that you need to go through this particular performance process before you can terminate any, uh, the employment and you didn't follow that process, then that could be a breach of contract claim. So again, only have those types of processes in policies and make sure your contract says the policies don't form part of the contract because you don't want to have a contractual obligation to engage in some type of performance management process and stick to that process. You want to have as much flexibility as possible. Um, so in terms of the unfair dismissal claims, as we saw, there's about 16,000, much more than any other claim we saw in the commission last year. Um, and what we're looking at in an unfair dismissal is, was the termination of employment harsh, unjust or unreasonable? And I've got on the screen there what the court or the commission will consider in that, um, in that claim. So were there, was there a valid reason for dismissal? And we looked at that case just before where the commission said there wasn't a valid reason for dismissal um, because the, the, those factors that weighed against 
the seriousness of the performance meant that there wasn't a valid reason for termination. Were they notified of the reason? Were they given an opportunity to respond? Are there any mitigating factors? And that's, I think, where you're working from home um, consideration will come in, but it also considers things like someone's length of service. So if they've got 10 years of service and this is the first occasion that there's been a blip in their performance, that might be a factor that weighs um, in favour of not terminating the employment in certain circumstances. Um, if there was unsatisfactory performance, were they warned about their performance before dismissal? Um, so it's really important that we have those conversations with an employee. And that's why I'm saying don't just come to your um, HR or your leaders when you say, I want to get rid of this person or terminate this person. We need to be doing it much earlier on because the commission will say, well, did you tell this person that if their performance did not improve, that termination of employment might be an outcome? And you should do that in writing. And um, procedural fairness is important. We'll look at that in a second in relation to that same case we've been talking about. And then there's other things like um, the size of the organisation. So do they have a HR department that should kind of know how to do a performance management process? Those types of things. Um, so in terms of that case that we looked at with the salesperson who was working remotely, um, in that case, there was no formal performance improvement plan proposed or implemented. And that was a factor that weighed against um, a finding that there was a, a valid um, dismissal. Um, also, uh, in her contract, those periodic account, key account reviews were contemplated by her contract, but didn't, weren't conducted. So again, that's why I say be careful about what you include in your contract and have as much flexibility as possible, uh, because you don't want to set yourself up for failure. Uh, because this was that was the consideration in this case that they said, well, you said you were going to have those key account reviews and it didn't happen. Um, in March 2020, when she was um, clearly struggling, they say, to stay afloat amidst, amidst her multiple responsibilities, um, she did um, make that commitment around the internal reporting um, and then that lapsed. Um, and then there was also three instances of customer orders being overlooked. Um, and again, they say that that was um, kind of not um, significant enough to outweigh the other factors. Um, so those other factors about the worry of the uncertainty of um, having to deal with clients. So these clients' complaints were, as I understand, her not getting back to them and things like that. Um, and they said that you needed to take that into consideration in terms of those customer complaints because her workload had increased and she might not be servicing clients as well as she would have been but for the pandemic, basically, um, because she wasn't able to get out and see clients and things like that. Um, so that was a consideration in terms of the reasons they relied on for the termination in terms of those customer complaints, considering whether that was reasonable in those circumstances. Oops. Um, so they said that in the circumstances, there was also a denial of procedural fairness. So in addition to there not being that valid reason, because they said those factors outweighed the seriousness of the performance, um, they also didn't um, in institute the process correctly or fairly. Um, so basically they said, yes, they had that conversation in January, um, but the performance meeting that they had in March, at the end of March, occurred only a week after they had reduced her hours and salary and so she hadn't really had enough time to kind of reconcile okay well I've got reduced hours now how do I make all my work happen in those four days instead of five and how do I arrange those work demands. Um, also the warning letter that they issued to her which was on the 6th of April um, that happened only two days after that performance meeting on the 31st of March. So they said that wasn't enough time to act on the message she'd received in that meeting. Um, so to issue a warning following only two days after was not procedurally fair. They said she should have been given a longer period of time to improve that performance after that 31st of March meeting. And everyone always says, well, what's the appropriate period of time? There's no set answer to that. It has to be based on what the deficiency in performance is. So in, the, in this case, again, I'll, have, I'll show you in terms of what the commission said, in terms of what they thought would have been an appropriate timeframe. Um, and the other thing was, yes, she got that warning letter on the 6th of April, 
Then she was off work for the 7th, 8th and 9th of April and then it was Easter. So actually between um, the warning letter and the termination of her employment, there wasn't even one working day between those two. So that's why the commission said in those circumstances, it was also procedurally unfair in terms of how they had gone about. So even though there was technically seven days or whatever, in terms of working days and her being actually at the workplace and able to perform her role, there wasn't even one working day. So again, that's why I'm saying that if you're thinking about engaging in performance management and we need to do a formal process, don't think about it when we're made a decision that this person can't possibly stay here. We need much further lag time so we can go through a valid performance management process. And when, if an employee brings a claim, we can say to them, well, here's the process we conducted and here's the length of time they were given to improve their performance. Um, and we did everything procedurally fair. Um, so in terms of, as I said, one of the questions that I sometimes get asked in practice is, well, um, what should we have done then um, to make it more procedurally fair? Um, and I thought this was interesting from the case because they awarded her um, basically three months or 15 weeks compensation. Um, and what they said was this would have allowed um, for a reversal of her hours and salary reduction because basically what happened is um, that 20% reduction was reversed after Easter. So they calculated the amount of compensation she should receive on her 100% salary. They said um, there was a period to allow for the impact of COVID-19 to settle, which they said would have been two weeks. A period to allow performance to be assessed in light of the written warning, they said that should have been around four weeks. So again, like I said, they're assessing it on this case by case basis, but this is how they get to how much compensation she gets. So they said between the warning and the termination should have been at least four weeks. Um, then there um, should have been a final warning um, and discussions with her around that. They said that would have taken about a week. Um, performance to be assessed in light of that final written warning, another four weeks, they said. Um, and then a decision-making period around termination of employment about one week and then her notice period. Um, so they break it down very clearly in, in that case in terms of why they came to the decision in terms of the amount of compensation. And you can see there the process that, that should have been engaged in is a big factor in terms of how much compensation an employee can, can receive. So if you've gone through a very valid performance management process and given them an opportunity to improve, spoken to them about what we needed them to improve on and how they go about that, if you've done that in a very meticulous way and you can document it and you've got evidence of that performance improvement process or the plan, um, that's going to go a long way to limiting a claim of unfair dismissal, as you can see in the circumstances. Um, and I'll just finish in terms of some practical tips to think about in terms of what we've talked about today. I think it's important to understand um, your rights and obligations. So again, thinking about what does it mean if we do terminate an employee's employment? What are the risks that we face and how do we go about limiting those risks? Um, look at your contracts, look at your policies. Is there an enterprise agreement that applies or a modern award that applies that might dictate some ways we need to do certain things? Um, so be very clear on that. Be very clear on what those work standards are. So as I said, your position descriptions or make sure that um, employees are very clear on what the performance is expected and have those conversations really early on. Um, use your probation periods. So I can't tell you the number of times um, where I've had someone um, call me and say, can we extend the probation period? The answer is yes, you can. Um, but uh, well, generally the answer is yes you can because the contract will say we, we can extend it or otherwise their employment is going to be terminated um, but think about that um, very carefully because again um, a probationary period is different to the period of time they have to have completed to be able to bring an unfair dismissal claim um, and also um, in my experience if an employee isn't performing in their first six months of employment, which is usually the time for your probation period, it's unlikely that miraculously their performance is going to start improving in the seventh month. Unless there's been some significant thing that happened to them perhaps in that six months, it's unlikely to turn around. Um, so use your probation periods. 
And again, don't come to a HR manager or a leader on the last day of the probation period and say, we need to get rid of this person. Again, we need to really lead up to that. Um, make sure you're assessing and communicating performance, as I said, throughout that employment life cycle um, and having those conversations with employees throughout their employment. Don't just do it in that six month review um, or 12 month review. Addressing it as it happens, I think is far better um, to then, for example, letting it build up and just blurting it all out in that six month review and employees then don't want to participate in those reviews and you don't get um, good results or have a a good culture if that happens. Um, think about other ways we can seek to address performance before getting to that termination stage um, in terms of warnings and things like that. As we saw in that case, the commission said you should have done a warning um, and a final warning and things like that. And as I've mentioned, um, sensitive but sensible exits. So be sensitive that someone's obviously going to lose their employment, um, but do it in a sensible manner in terms of making sure we've ticked all those boxes. And it's not like you have to um, be the big ogre in terms of terminating someone's employment and stamp your feet and do all those things. Be sensitive um, that, yeah, someone's going to be losing their job and put yourself in their shoes, but also um, be confident that you can do it provided you've followed all those things um, that I've talked about uh, in terms of gone through that process and able to show that we've adequately addressed the performance and we've got our documentation in order, those types of things. Um, I think that's it in terms of the um, content I wanted to cover. We've got a couple of minutes for questions if anyone had anything um, that they wanted to ask me. Um, I don't have any questions in the chat that I can see unless I'm missing it. Um, and if no one has any questions, uh, then we can sign off for this afternoon. You can go enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. If you can feel free to leave now, um, we'll obviously be back again next month with another webinar. Um, feel free to sign off now. Otherwise, I'll just wait a couple of minutes to see if there's any questions. Thank you all for joining me today. Doesn't look like we have any questions, I don't think. Oh, I've got one. Um, do you see negotiated separations leading to claims often? Uh, no, generally because, so if I do a negotiated separation, I would usually have them sign a deed of release, which means they release from claims. Um, so if there's an agreeable um, negotiated separation, then it doesn't usually lead to a claim. Um, it doesn't mean that they can't bring a workers' compensation claim, so they could still do that. Um, but generally, those negotiated separations um, result in, a, in um, no claims being um, made and a, a resolution between the parties. Um, in, if you're asking if we have the conversation and the person says, no, I don't want to agree to that, does it result in claims? Um, I don't think it necessarily increases the prevalence of an employee wanting to bring a claim. Again, if you've engaged in the process and you continue to engage in that process um, adequately, then I don't think it um, really increases an employee's ability to bring a claim or um, want them wanting to bring a claim. Um, anything else? Persistent sick ears, they take a day off every time they accrue one. How to address this? I know they are not genuinely sick, but how to prove this? <laughs> um, yes, so yeah, I think there's a, um, some, some people that I've worked with say that there's a, um, the Great Australian Employee is the one who uses all their 10 days sick leave each year because they know they don't get them when they, they leave. Um, so again, I think that comes back to, um, can you ask for evidence? So I'm not sure um, if you are asking for evidence for that one day of sick leave, you can under the legislation. Again, um, have a look at your policies around asking them to produce medical certificates. Even then you can probably easily go and get um, a medical certificate um, from a doctor these days. Um, most employers tell me they get given out pretty readily. Um, but in terms of um, addressing that, you need to tread carefully because an employee is entitled obviously to take, um, to take sick leave uh, and that's an um, entitlement. So you need to tread carefully 
Um, Bill, you've just said what I, I think was alluding to. Yes, they handed out like lollies. Um, so you need to tread carefully because they do have an entitlement to take that leave. Um, but there are ways that you can have conversations with employees around. So we're seeing that um, th there's a, there's a um, pattern in terms of behaviour. Is there anything we need to be aware of? How can we help you through this? Those types of conversations. Um, and I generally find that once you start to have those conversations, um, the prevalence of them just changing in sick notes when they don't feel like coming to work um, stops. Other organisations have done really drastic things like not have a limit on sick leave. So I think it's Virgin um, Australia or Virgin, um, they have an unlimited sick leave policy and they did that because they said that there's that mentality to use those sick leave days or personal leave days. And if you just have an abundance of them, they're not as inclined to um, use the sick leave days. So that's another interesting thing. Um, if they have used all their sick leave, can you make them take the extra days as annual leave. Um, so you can't make them. So usually annual leave would be take, is taken by agreement, but if they've run out of personal leave or sick leave days and they're still sick, um, they could ask to take their annual leave in those circumstances. Otherwise it would have to be unpaid leave that they're taking because they wouldn't have any other um, entitlements. Um, any other questions? Okay, well, I think we're right on time. It's 101. So as I said, thank you all for joining me today. Hopefully you found that helpful um, and we'll see you at next month's webinar.